Hola, somos Tania Moreno y Daniela Álvarez de TCU. Y estás escuchando College Volleyball Weekly. ¡Go Frogs! This is Tania Moreno and Daniela Álvarez from TCU. And you're on College Beach Volleyball Weekly. ¡Go, Go Frogs! Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford Beach Volleyball and you are listening to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition. Hi, I'm Alana Rennie of Arizona Beach Volleyball. And I'm Alex Parker of Arizona Beach Volleyball. And you're listening to College Beach Volleyball Weekly. Is that right? No. <laughs> hey, good day, everyone, and welcome to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Top 20 season recap almost two months later. Yes, that is. I'm going to fall on my sword and say that's my fault. Uh, being super busy right after the college balls have dropped both indoor and on the beach because of USA and all the other stuff, stuff that I've been working on. But on the screen, Alana Rennie of Arizona, Matt Fitzpatrick, Florida State, and Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford Beach. Ladies, thank you for joining me once again. I know you guys are repeat offenders on the show. We'll call you guys. <laughs> uh, okay. But I appreciate you guys taking the time and giving insight to the game that we enjoy following, and that's just provided so much action just in this 2022 season alone. Of course. It's always an honor to talk about beach volleyball and with you guys. So happy to be back. I missed you guys. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. I feel like this is, what, my third time back now? Yes, it is. That's right. The famous, uh, you're the first voiceover in the intro with Alex blowing the uh, name <laughs> yeah. of the show, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you should not have given her that responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we go into, we're going to try something new that we've been doing on the men's side, the division one, two, top 15, uh, pardon the interruption. We called it the CRS, the coaches challenge or challenge review system, where we discuss the topics or we challenge the topics in the day, but we call it, or just going to call it PTI here for beach, since I couldn't think of a beach term that would relate. So, but there are a lot of news and, uh, I hate to start off on a sad note, but um, uh, just in recent days, uh, Capri Gortowski, head coach of FAU, uh, passed uh, cancer uh, just a few days ago. So we want to just uh, remember her. We know that she was highly loved and respected by all the players that played with her for her over the years. And everything that I've heard about her, even though I had not met her personally, uh, she's one of the most charismatic, most encouraging, and most uh, loving coach that anyone could have on the program and I only know that because of repeat offender guests uh, Mackenzie Morris and Erica Brock um, who played for their entire careers and that's the history setting pair of FAU playing at the number ones so but I wanted to give our our panel here a chance to just uh, share a few words about what they know about a career and I think uh, Mads I think you had something to say yeah so I've heard from everyone who was coached by her uh, Brooke Bauer grew up coached by her um and everyone just says that she is, she gives her all to beach volleyball and she was so kind and loving. And I think it's apparent how much she gave to beach volleyball. I mean, just this past tournament, she was there and she was coaching and I don't think I saw a tournament that she missed. So her devotion and love to her players really speaks volumes to who she is as a person. And, yep. and the world is definitely sad to see what happened. Charlie or Alana, anything to add? I think just echoing Matt, what Mads had to share. I mean, I've never, I was never, I never had the fortunate opportunity to be coached by her personally, but everything that I've ever heard about her has been nothing but absolutely wonderful, wonderful, wonderful words. Um, she, that's a really, really big hole that's going to be in the beach volleyball community for a while. Yeah, I'm still sort of new to the beach scene, so I didn't really um, know about her, know of her that well, but just seeing, even seeing like the beach volleyball community like come together on social media and stuff and like remember her and, you know, post things and post memories and stuff, I was able to like learn a little bit about her and she's just seemed like the sweetest person. Well, this was a historic year for FAU, making the uh, term for the first time in program history. Um, she's survived by her husband, Steve, and two young children. Um, a volleyball family who truly love the sport. So um, Capri, uh, God speed to you and uh, our prayers with uh, Steve and the family. Um, so with that, let's uh, move on to the other news in uh, NCA Beach. And we talked about it a little bit before coming on. I think of us, all of us are looking for clarification how this will impact the game, but the NCAA expands competitive opportunities in women's beach ball, volleyball, allowing competition in the fall. Um, you know, at least 
geographically where I'm at, and I know Charlie can say the same, and even Alana, because I did come across you in the fall this last year, there are plenty of fall tournaments. And I think uh, FSU is in a few fall tournaments as well. Um, but how does this, this change impact or what kinds of things do you see happening uh, with this addition, additional time to be on the court? And we'll start with Charlie, because I think she had some uh, thoughts as well uh, when we were discussing. Yeah, so I'm still... <laughs> I think a lot of us, I don't, I don't know if I'm just speaking for myself, but a lot of people that I've spoken with are a little bit still pretty green to hearing the news. Um, I didn't even know that there was really going, that there were really proposals going forward about expansion of fall competition. So hearing the news, it sounds like it could be an awesome thing. I almost worry from time to time about the potential for um, just almost overuse on players' bodies because of the insinuation of beach volleyball expanding to look similar to the tennis format where um, I believe Alana and I were talking about this earlier that tennis players play year round in these tournaments that we kind of see their season never really seems to start stop finish and so I'm almost curious to see what the beach volleyball scene will look there will we have a true off season preseason postseason what will it look like in future but I do think, I mean, I always love the fall preseason, kind of mixing up pairs from there. So I hope that this will just kind of give us more opportunity to play more individual pairs, offer more individual pairs around to kind of test our lineups that we don't normally get to test in competition because of the fact that, I mean, season is such a limited span of time. So test new things, kind of work out new projects. I'm excited to see where Stanford goes with it because we haven't heard much from our coaches yet. And so it'll be great to kind of see what we do there. Yep. Alana, thoughts? <clears throat> um, yeah, I think it's fun to mix up the pairs. Definitely. I think that you could see some random things that coaches maybe never even thought about that could work out, but to play devil's advocate, I think it could, um, like spread out the fall competitions a little bit. I know from previous experience, we would do like a Paris tournament after like an actual duel and stuff. And the Paris tournament is just like detrimental on our body like it just it like deteriorates us and kind of is just a long day and gets us really tired but we want to have as much play as we can so I think maybe like expanding this could limit those types of tournaments and kind of let us actually play instead of have like a tournament style and then uh, Matt yeah so I just have a little bit to say burnout is definitely a risk. I knew when I read about it, I was initially very jealous that this came out after I've graduated and I can't compete in it because, you know, all fall year, you, um, you like desire that, that feeling of competition in the spring. So I get that that could kind of quench a little bit of the thirst in the fall, but it could go either way. So it'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Okay. Let me read the three main bullet points that are pertinent to this, this new, uh, NCA requirement. It's a uh, allows up to four multiple day pairs tournaments for beach volleyball players during the fall season, or what they call as a non championship season, which mirrors the structure that is currently in place for men's and women's tennis. Second bullet point is competition is for individual pairs tournaments rather than team events. And then the third was it eliminates the restrictions on missed class and transportation to allow student athletes to participate in multi day events. So being a non student. I don't know how that affects me. So <laughs> the one the one thing that I can even add to that that actually is really nice in the kind of like legislature in all the bullet points there is that no unmissed class and travel restrictions. So that might actually open a couple doors for I know that there are travel restrictions that you can't miss any class in non-championship season. And so we might have girls that end class on a Friday at 3 p.m. We have practice at 3.30, but then that means that we can't travel until 3 p.m. on that Friday. And we don't fly in preseason usually. I don't know if that's actually a restriction or not, but we bus everywhere in our preseason competitions. And so we might be taking the bus down to Los Angeles for a tournament in rush hour at 3 p.m. and <laughs> having a eight or nine hour drive that should be five or six. So the travel restrictions being less restricted and opening up a little bit more could be really great on players' bodies that might get really, really um, disturbed by longer travel days. So that's great news to hear. And that hopefully will open the doors for a lot. I mean, more like opportunities to play against teams from across the country. Cause I know that we tend to keep to only California teams that we play in preseason, but 
could be fun to do an individual pairs tournament in Florida or something along the lines of that. Yep. Uh, Alana or Mads, anything to add? Nope. <laughs> yeah, right. that's, yeah, that's pretty spot on. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump up to the other news item. Coach of the year, Grand Canyon's Kristen Rohr. Uh, she finishes the season, or her team finishes at 26 and 7, and the final ABCA poll comes in at number nine. Thoughts on Kristen receiving the honor. We'll start with, we'll go to the other Arizona on screen, Alana, who's actually um, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. <laughs> Yeah, um, I actually was coached by her a little bit um, at RPM before I came to uh, Arizona, and she's really nice. She really knows her stuff and has a great way of coaching, like really knows how to talk to you and get her message across and kind of sometimes maybe if you don't understand it, we'll like change her way and kind of make sure you understand it in a way that's comfortable for you. But um, no, I think it's a great honor for her and I'm happy for her. Mads or Charlie, anything to add on that? Yeah, I think she's definitely doing something right. Every time we played Grand Canyon, it was always a scrappy battle and it was really fun. So uh, she's she's definitely doing good at Grand Canyon and I'm, I'm happy for her. Same, you two both said it absolutely wonderfully, but I'm super happy for Kristen. And I mean, their season was a fantastic season. Grand Canyon was a force, like wherever they went. And so seeing them make their first national championship appearance, seeing them have the best season in their program history. I mean, that's an incredible feat to have. And it really, really speaks to Kristen's leadership and kind of building that program up. Yep. All right. Next bullet point, ABCA pair of the year, Tina Gradina and Haley Howard of USC. We're going to start with Mads on this one. Go to Atlanta and then end with Charlie. Yeah, I, I got to watch them dominate all year. It's really, really fun to watch. And I've heard great things about Tina Gradina. I heard that she's not cocky at all. And she's very humble and she's great. Um, she like teaches the, the rest of the USC players things and she's able to be taught by them. Like, it just seems like it's a great atmosphere um, that she brings to the USC table and Haley Howard is just in, an insane beast. So I'm happy for them. They definitely earned this um, title 100%. All right. Yeah, well, I had the joy of playing them twice this year, and um, you know we competed. But they are—they're just a really good team. They're both consistent, and they know what they're doing out on the court. They have the power and the finesse, which makes it really hard to play against. But they are also two very nice people. You know, I'm—I'm I'm the captain. I get to go and do the coin flip, so you know I get to introduce myself to Tina. I've never spoken to her before, but you know, really nice. And we had one play, um, and it was not a very beautiful play um that was called for them and then towards the end of the game Haley Howard came up to me and was like man you should have gotten that call like sorry that happened and stuff like that so they're I mean they're good people on and off the court so I think they're very deserving it's because Haley is also an Arizonan yes so, an Arizona <laughs> defender at that so yes. you guys are connected mm -hmm. <laughs> all right Charlie yeah, so I've I had the pleasure of playing them. I had the pl pleasure of playing them as well. Or I don't know if it's pleasure, but they're, I mean, they're a fantastic team. And like you guys said, like fantastic humans. I've had the pleasure, I've had the pleasure this time of actually practicing with them a couple of times and getting to know them as people off the court as well as on the court. And I mean, they're fantastic humans. And I don't, I don't think anybody was really surprised by them getting play a pair of the year because they were absolutely just completely dominant. And I think Haley is an absolute physical beast. And it was really awesome to see her, um, for lack of better, more proper wording, pop off this year. Um, but it was also, I mean, there's no, there's nobody who in the world who can say that Tina Graudina isn't fully deserving and absolutely an incredible, incredible volleyball player. And um, she's done such great things for this sport great things for the sport in Latvia, great things for the sport in the U.S. I mean, them as a pair, they're fantastic. Yeah. I'll just add that, you know, with uh, seeing Tina play a bunch of times and Haley, even from the Long Beach State days, both of them are phenomenal super athletes and they have such intense volleyball IQs. I mean, I remember seeing Tina, her freshman year at USC, pulling off this crazy block move to throw the attacker off. And I was like, who does that? You know, even some of the top players, that during that year weren't doing that kind of stuff and she was a beast at the net and she's playing with um oh my goodness uh abril bustamante mm -hmm. uh so another fiery but very charismatic player great combo for sc but you can tell that 
you know, uh, Tina was still learning, but she was so teachable. And I think that's what um, Anna and Dane have appreciated in her talent that she's even as good of a player as she is, she's still very teachable as is uh, Haley. So um, definitely well-deserving of the pair. Mm -hmm. So let's jump off into our new section that I'm trying with our contributors today. The pardon the interruption or the rundown ESPN style. What I do is I bounce questions off each of our panelists and do their best to answer. There is no right or wrong because again, these three are seeing their fellow competitors on the court and they have the best experience to judge what they're doing. So I always love seeing the, the player's perspective versus the media, you know, the armchair quarterbacks like myself seeing the play. So um, let's get into this and let's have fun with this. All right, ladies. Okay. All right, here we go. All right. What team overachieved exceeding expectations during a 2022 season? We'll start with Matt's. Uh, I give one. Okay. I'm going to go with TCU. It was for lack of proper wording, their pop-off year as well. They crushed <laughs> it. They almost won CCSAs. They were, they came in ranked two in national championships. They were kind of the team that no one saw coming and they came and they conquered wonderfully. Yep. Alana. Um, I gave mine to GCU Grand Canyon, even though they're kind of our rivals. So I wish I couldn't, but you know, I got to give them creds for this season. They've always been on the come up. Um, but I think this year they really kind of just like dominated and showed who they were and like put themselves on the map. Yep. And Charlie. I'm going to give mine to Georgia state. Um, they did a really incredible thing. I mean, they won their conference for the first time ever in program history and they made an NCAA appearance um, and had some pretty gnarly upsets at NCAAs. And so Georgia State, I mean, they really impressed me. I didn't hear much about them through season and then actually seeing them at the end of season and really watching what they were capable of was really, really incredible. Yep. You know, I have to jump in on this one and it's not like disagree with all of you, but I would say FAU. Um, I mean, they're riding the backs of their number ones, Erica and Mac. And, but it created such a great momentum for the rest of that squad because they pulled out some gutty wins that got them into the tournament for the first time. So but all excellent selections, nonetheless. You know, I'm thinking about Alana's, and they had Samaya Morin for Grand Canyon, uh, Hanson also at the number twos, and, and they just have uh, Anaya Rose at the ones. There's some really good pieces in place there. And Georgia State's upset. You guys all nailed it. So all good stuff. Next one, who are your top three pairs at any flight in 2022? We'll start with Charlie on this one. Okay. Um top three there were a lot of very very talented pairs out there I want to say to start at threes Julia Scholes and Delaney Maple of USC um, they were really really impeccable throughout season and that's another pair of like two phenomenal humans off the court and on the court so really really impressed by the two of them um, I want to also say from an NCAA appearance and throughout season LSU in general, their lower lineup pairs of their fours and fives were really, really staples. I know that their fours, I believe it was Grace Seitz and Ellie Shank. Um, it could have been a different defender. They kind of mixed up Grace with some different defenders, but really kind of, it was Grace and Kelly Agnew, Grace and Ellie Shank. Um, oh, and Riley Allred, I believe also was on yep. that pair for a while too. And literally regardless of all three of those defenders did incredible things. They were kind of working up through the lineup periodically but I mean they won a lot of games they were really impressive so I guess I, that was kind of like three pairs in one but I I should probably two pairs in an entire team that's okay we got you Charlie <laughs> yes I think that that's probably good <laughs> yeah well let's jump over to Atlanta on this one top three um, pairs at any flight or team like Charlie <laughs> I, <laughs> um I kind of like focus on two I guess so I guess we'll kind of balance it out um, but one of mine was definitely a Delaney Maple and Julia Schools. I mean, they're just really consistent and both have the power and the like craftiness and stuff to play against. Um, my others was Washington's uh, Chloe Lorene and Natalie Robinson before Chloe got hurt. Um, they're just, you know, kind of, they're very under the radar and a force to be reckoned with. And it's really fun to play against them. Um, you know, Chloe is really a strong player, a very smart player, and she's really consistent. And so I'm sure playing with her, um, 
you get to do a lot of the things that you want to do and be able to focus on what you want to do. So I think together they made a really good pair and were consistent and kind of caught some people off guard. Yep. Mads. Yeah, so I'm kind of echoing them a little bit. I think no one can deny that uh, that Delaney Maple and Julia Scholes had an insane season, crushing teams, really fun to watch. Um, I think Sammy Slater and Megan Kraft, pretty much undefeated except for two losses. They are incredible. Um, and then Jaden Whitmarsh and Devin Newberry. I played against them and they are so much fun, like so scrappy, Jaden. And then Devin's got that nasty, like sharp, cross swing that's pretty much ungettable i don't know if i dug a single one of those so all three of those yeah <laughs> and i just uh, asked who, who, who yeah, are those, those two losses to <laughs> no, I, me thank you <laughs> I to smile and i was like i don't want to say it <laughs> i loved elena i think we looked at each other through the yeah. screen there we both had the same thought we're like i, like, I wonder if oh. two losses on you had to make note that it was two losses yeah those two distinct losses that we remember Mm. just so well i I felt bad saying it (laughs) well i'm gonna add just a couple i'm gonna say uh megan rice reka orsi toth of the number ones for lmu um you know i saw the winning record but i wasn't a believer until i saw them at the wcc tournament and gosh they just steamrolled people and uh, Megan Rice is a blocking machine. You know, when I looked at her, uh, I thought, oh, she's got to be 6'1", 6'2". She's listed at 5'11". And wow. uh, she was touching so much. Uh, maybe it was a, an error in the uh, program I was looking at, but I know she plays a lot bigger because I know that she hits the spit off the ball. <laughs> so um, <laughs> she definitely was a, a, a high flyer along with the uh, Orsi Toth playing defender behind her who got to a ton of balls. Um, one of the other teams that that definitely is one of the hottest teams of the year. I say this not because she's on the screen, but Mads and Elena, you guys had a hot start at the threes. And we actually talked about it a little earlier, but, and then coach Brooks said, you know what? You're good enough. I'm, I'm pumping you up to the twos. So um, yeah, definitely. Those, those are two of the, the pairs in my, my top flights in 2022. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can definitely hang up my jersey. Very proud of the way that it ended. So thank you. <laughs> As you should. As thank you should. All right. I know this one I listed in one line item, but I'm going to just go through and do each one. But best blocker, we're going to go with Alana on this one first. Um, I want to start with Megan Craft. Uh, I think she's just so long and controls the net so well. And I wrote in my notes here that I did see something that Triborn said that like on defense as a blocker, you should still be on offense and you should go attack the ball when the attacker is actually hitting. Um, and I think she does a really good job of that. Every time I've seen her play, it's just dominant on the net and the other team just always kind of struggles to get it around her. And when they do, like they, they just feed it right into her defender. So I think she does a really good job. Yep. And they're going to be in Gestad with uh, Emily Stockman. Yeah. And they've already got two first place finishes on the FIVB uh, Beach Volleyball World Tour. Uh-huh. So she's a real deal. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go to Mads here. Best blocker. Uh, Kylie DeBerg at LSU on their twos. She's an absolute wall and you can feel her presence. I can be like five feet off the net and I just feel her in front of me. Um, The diving, the diving into the angle when I didn't see her there, I don't know how she hides so well, but the diving blocks and then also swatting shot blocks, like she does it all and very impressive. All right. And then Charlie. I have to say I'm like lightly upset with the two of you because you took, I had two written down and you took both of them. Oh, because they didn't say Charlie Ekstrom is the best blocker? <laughs> no, I literally, I had Meg Kraft and I had Kylie DeBerg and I was just talking actually today with um, the Norse twins and they were talking about um, playing and watching Kylie play because we were talking about how absurd of a block Kylie DeBerg is. And they said that they watched her in this rally she for like she wasn't fully up at the net like it was a quick play and one of the players that she was playing against went up to kind of like set option fake out set option roll it over and Kylie's standing probably five feet off the net and took the set over and hit it back standing on the 15 foot line and I mean it just speaks like she is a massive force at the net like she is very reminiscent of tearing cloth like big blocks like that we don't have very frequently 
out in the beach world and she was a force her standing touch is like eight eight (laughs) 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 all right well the next next spot is your best defender let's start with charlie and go backwards on this one okay i'm going to have to say so i had one standout defender um being lexi denneberg this year and that is a huge reason of that is because of the fact that Lexi converted from a full-time blocker to a full-time defender this year. And she has been absolutely incredible. She's been a great split. She's been a great block. She's been a great defender. We see Lexi kind of everywhere on the court and she's able to kind of fill any position. Um, And so she's going to take the cake for that one for me. Yep. All right. Elena, you can say yourself if you want. Oh no, definitely not. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, mine was actually a good friend of mine's, uh, Kelly Green Agnew from LSU. Um, she's really consistent. And I remember, um, my other teammate and I, every time we would look on LSU's, uh, Instagram page to look at the results, she was one of the people who won if they, if they lost, if they won, you know, we always saw her name highlighted and she played with a lot of different people and always seemed to be on the winning side with them. And, um, you know, she's just someone who always gives 110% effort. And so I think her effort gives her other partner, like the effort and kind of like the will to bring it out of them. So I think she takes the cake on that one for me. Excellent. How about you, Mats? I got to give it to my girl, Brooke Bauer. You wouldn't expect it being that she's (laughs) tall and everyone's like, oh, she should be a blocker. But no, her reading is insane. She's super quick and scrappy. Um, And then I've seen the best defense I've ever seen was her and Maddie playing UCLA's ones in that semifinal game. Like Brooke was just touching and digging everything. So Brooke Bauer for me. All right, I'm going to drop a three on mine. And it's actually a person and a pair who do split duty, but I haven't seen them play. I'm gonna go with Atlanta because he definitely got some highlight reels and you know, I've got them. I've got the video. I've seen you do some good things on defense. That's cool (laughs) to see uh, U of A represented in that way because it's been pretty uh, phenomenal stuff that you're doing. So uh, definitely shout out to you, but um, I haven't seen Georgia State play, but the Ferrari twins, obviously, I don't even know if they put up a block. How could they just play defense? I they're both five four, <laughs> and they're winning. They have like a twenty seven and three record. They could not lose. They could not lose. They were. My fantastic. mom came up to me and was like, "They're only five four. How are they doing it?" I was like, "I <laughs> don't know. I don't have an answer for that." And they, I'm like, one. Yeah, I'm so mad at myself for not saying their names. They're like my favorite team of all time. They're incredible. Did you train we against them last them. summer though? Uh, I did. I did. They're so <laughs> funny. That they, they get. They'll get like mad at each other and then they'll not talk to each other, but then like they love each other, but it's super intense. I just love everything about them. (laughs) Well, definitely some uh, good athletes mentioned there. Let's uh, go to the attacker, best attacker. We'll start with Alana on this one to Mads and then the Charlie. So this one for me was Lexi Denneberg. I just think, um, you know, I wanted to give her defender because she switched, but I think this also gave her another way because you know defender you have to defend the ball in order to attack basically so I think she did a great job of doing that and being able to convert everything I remember playing against her and you know we could never give her enough angle to hit the ball straight down and she was always able to you know she's really intimidating and she knows how to you know push her power through the net and I think she just has all of the options on shots too I think she's got it all yep go to Matt's I was going to say Lexi as well. She's incredible. But, oh, and while you were talking, I thought of a second one. I am biased, but Elena Chacon is undeniably <laughs> insane. Um, she jumps so high. And then and like, she had she'll butter from you. Really- so she was Thank always going to be crushing. <laughs> Thank you. I should have brag on her. Like she'll get a really short shot and she'll be on the ground. And then in two seconds, she's up and then hitting the ball straight down. She's an animal. So I just have to shout her out there. Yep. Charlie. I want to give a shout out here and just acknowledge like Brooke Van Sickle of University of Hawaii. (laughs) I think Brooke has the heaviest arm of anybody I've ever met. I got to play with her. She, we played, um, as we are, we were like a USA pair together last summer and got the pleasure of playing with her. I've played against her. It hurts to block her hits. It hurts to dig her. (laughs) That girl has, I I swear it's, she swings harder than anybody that I've ever met. And she's five, eight and jumps through the gym and, 
or not the gym, jumps through the gym. She's an indoor player as well, but jumps through the sand. Like it is insane what she is able to hit the angles, the placement. She's a phenomenal offensive player. Yep. I'm going to drop two, which is crazy. They're both Floridians and they actually are playing together with uh, team USA. Maddie Anderson, number one's at Florida state and Lexi Denneberg, Mm -hmm. which when you see them play together, it's like the bombing duo right there because they both are bouncing over backstops and they've got some heavy arm swings as uh, I think we've all seen. And uh, they've definitely made a bunch of highlight reels. So uh, Maddie Anderson and Lexi Denneberg keep swinging and repping USA while you're at it. So now I didn't put this on the line item, so I'm going to catch you guys off guard, but best server. I'll give you guys, a, I'll start. I'm going to say Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford, because one thing I've realized, even from when I first met you at the Collegiate Beach Volleyball Championships for USA Volleyball, your serve has gotten harder, faster, and more precise every single year I've seen you. And there is a pop off your serve at the service line. And uh, I see you getting some, even at the um, uh, USAD TP last summer, I see you get so many aces in that tournament and you were ticking off some of the teams you were playing because it literally was coffin corner with maybe a millimeter on the line. It seemed like it was consistent. So Charlie, definitely hats off to your serving game. So I'm going to jump over to, we'll say Mads on this, this, uh, this one. Yeah, so top server comes to mind, Kaylee McHugh. I don't know if anyone was able to watch her serve, but she's got a top spin and it's super quick and fast and it will drop right in front of you or it'll hit a line and she's very powerful for being so small. So definitely Kaylee McHugh. I got aced by her like 15 times and I'm not afraid to admit it. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go to Charlie on this one. It, that's actually really funny that you said Kaylee McHugh. First of all, Rob, you made me blush a whole lot. That was very, very kind of you. But it's really funny that you said Kaylee McHugh because she came to mind also, Mads, because we kind of had, we played, when we played at TCU, our match went down to 15-13 and it was the dual decider that um, Kaylee and Sutton ended up taking it. But, or Kaylee and um, Haley Hamlet ended up taking it at the time. And they won 15, 13, but the entire match was, it was identical scores on the first two sets. And it was literally like who got more aces. Like she and I were like both working the sidelines and Haley Hamlet, actually, I'm going to add her to that. Haley Hamlet of TCU has one of the most insane serves that I have ever, ever played against. It is like the two of them together were, it was not, not okay. How gnarly of serving was going on in that game. Yep. And then to Atlanta. Um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of Julia Scholes. I remember, I think it was either Pac-12 South or Pac-12 Championship. So we were hosting, but I think she ripped off about six like powerhouse top spin serves in a row um, to each corner, to the middle, dropping in front, hitting the tape and rolling over. Like she just, every single one came out. Yep. Good stuff. All right. Um. I don't know if I should do so. I was was thinking of one more category, but I'm going to leave it out. So let's just go right to the next one. What were the biggest upsets in 2022 in your opinion? Mads. So I I hate that I'm talking about FSU so much, but uh, we hadn't beat TCU yet all season. I'm pretty sure or we've beaten them once. I don't really remember, but we came into conference rank second. Um, And we ended up beating them in conference to take the title again, which was awesome. But I don't think anyone expected us to win because TCU had beaten us so many times before. So I would say FSU's win versus TCU in conference. All right. How about you, Charlie? I was going to say it's another win over TCU. Um, Georgia State's win over TCU at NCAA championships. Um, That was the biggest. uh, There were a couple upsets that, and Georgia State, shockingly, was involved in most of the upsets that happened, I want to say, at NCAA championships this year. But their upset of TCU, I watched it. We were stuck in the airport. Stanford Beach Volleyball had a horrible 30-hour travel trip home. But, yeah, it it was a while, and we were stranded in a couple airports, (laughs) split, split between the team and in the process of being stranded, we got to watch a lot of the games and watching that TCU Georgia state game come down in the third set. I mean, it was such a nail biter and it was such an incredible upset by Georgia state. And I think it really, really put them on the map a lot more than they've been on beach volleyball in a while. So awesome win by them. 
Anna for Lana? me, um, I had two. They weren't really, um, I don't know, like, I don't know how to say it, like, just advertised. I catchers. Or I guess. <laughs> um, but Boise State beat Cal Poly 4-1 um, in, like, the end of April. That's right. I remember yeah. We were there on that trip, but we left the day that happened. So unfortunately we didn't get to see it, but I remember watching it on the, or seeing it on their Instagrams and kind of being really shocked and, you know, a little upset because we've always lost to Cal Poly and we've always beaten Boise State. So eventually it'll happen for us, but we'll see. Um, <clears throat> then also UC Davis beat Hawaii. Yeah. Um, three two in long beach in the middle of march so i i also did not get to see that match but i wish i did yep all right what player or players had breakout seasons in 2022 let's go with atlanta on this one you First. know i actually couldn't really narrow this down um i think for me it was more of the teams um, I'm also not very good with faces and names, so I could probably just easily be forgetting about some people throughout the season, but um, maybe if you guys say some names, I'll think of someone. <laughs> All right, well, let's jump over to uh, Matt. I definitely say Avery Popinga. I think she found her, her voice and her moxie at LMU, and she just annihilated a bunch of awesome teams. So I'm really happy and proud of her for how she played. And then Sutton, I, Matt, Matt Tovich. Mac Tavish. Mac Tavish. That's hard. <laughs> we um, have been butchering her name this entire time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've talked to her like a million times. I just can't say her last name. But um, she had a really great season and it was really good seeing her come from Pepperdine and just absolutely thrive and take TCU to the heights that it was at this year. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I forgot where I was at. Charlie, is that you then? Then yes. Um this one is uh somebody special on the screen, uh Mads Fitzpatrick and Elena Chacon. I mean, you guys have been together a quite a few times, but I'd say that this season really stood out. I want to say as your guys' breakthrough season, you have done so many incredible things. I think when I was looking you guys up, like can neither confirm nor deny that I was looking you guys up before this, but I think <laughs> somehow like a little birdie said and told me that you guys are either the number two or three all-time pair wins leaders at Florida State now. And I mean, it's incredible. You guys were every time that Florida State won, you guys seemed to be on that roster of that pair that won. Um, you led to a lot of upsets and you led to a lot of wins. There's a really, really awesome thing to be said about the fact that you took down the undefeated, the only undefeated team left in the nation of USC's twos twice at the national championship tournament. I mean, I think you guys broke through and broke a lot of glass in that break. Thank you so much. You're so yeah. sweet. You know, I'm going to throw a couple in there as well, um, just because I, again, uh, some of these, I'm just following stats and watching the numbers, but TCU's number ones of Danny Alvarez and uh, Tanya Moreno, and they're playing for Team Spain, and they were so hot at the beginning of the season, and they're still playing incredibly well, and they're, they're representing Spain internationally right now. They're, they're on the podium, and they are playing phenomenally well. Uh, Tanya plays a very similar uh, style as Carol Solberg of Brazil. Um, just a quick athletic jumper with a, a quick wrist snap. And, um, and, and Danny is just a great blocker. So uh, definitely heard that. But Florida State, Anna Long, she made some great leaps and bounds. And this is, was it her freshman or sophomore season? I know freshman. she's young. So. Freshman. Definitely, I looked at the numbers and I'm like, wow, I had no idea that she was that, you know, getting those great stats. And that's a great future for Florida State. 100%. She's our tallest player. Coach doesn't really recruit that many tall blockers. She's like the, the middle height athletic. But uh, Anna came in and made a huge splash right off the get-go. Yep. All right. We're going to give uh, Alana another chance here. If, she, if we, we rattled some names in her, but if not, no worries. Um, I, I'll, I'll shout out one of my own teammates, uh, Maya Kaiser. She was a transfer from USC. Yeah. Um, she actually used to be a defender, um, but she was a blocker this year with Sarah Blacker and the twos, and they were one of our most consistent pairs. Um, you know, we could kind of always rely on them, and I think she did a really good job, like, adapting into our team and stuff like that. All right. Now, I'll make it easy on you guys. You can't name your own teams, but... 
Who would you choose as a team to watch in 2023? We'll start with you, Charlie. Ooh, I mean, I know that we're not allowed to name our own team, so I'll pick some. <laughs> I'm making it easier on you. <laughs> yeah, making it easier. But I want to say, I think a team to watch that has never really been watched before is the University of Washington. They've got a couple of transfers coming in. Derek Olson just came on as their head coach, and he has done absolutely incredible things for that program so far. I mean, they had some crazy upsets, like they upset Berkeley this year. Um, and that's like never been heard of before for you, Deb. And so I think watching them and then getting the transfer of Tegan DeFalco, adding Piper Monk Heydrich, I think that they're going to do some good things in the coming year. They've got an already pretty solid team, but are adding some really big transfer names that will add to their depth. Yep. How about you, Alana? Um, yeah, I didn't really list any specific teams, but I kind of went on in sort of agreements with Charlie, with Washington, you know, Oregon, Utah, those Pac-12 schools that are smaller, that aren't really in depth with the um, beach volleyball community yet, but like are slowly starting to get there. And just all those smaller teams that are getting better transfers, that are starting better programs, that are getting better coaches, that are, you know, starting to compete with all these top teams. I think just everyone will be um, very competitive in the next coming years. Yep. How about you, Matt? Totally. The transfer game is a fun one. Like these yeah. teams that really weren't as good are like getting these awesome transfers and really just catapulting their team to the next level. Um, for sure, UCLA, they were young this year. I think that they're going to be a force to reckon with, obviously, uh, next year. Um, TCU got Kate Privet, a transfer. I could talk about her all day long. She's fantastic. So that's great for TCU. I know they're losing a few seniors, but I don't think it'll be too much to hurt them. Um, and then Cal Berkeley is getting Liz Waters Liga. I think she's fantastic. So I think mm -hmm. Cal Berkeley will continue to be on the rise as well. Yeah, that transfer portal is changing the game because you know, I, I, I'm thinking of all these teams that did great recruiting, but then it's what happens in the portal in the off season that is the game changer. Exactly. But you know, I had some teams in mind just because of seeing some of the, the uh, recruiting classes, but as I had to step back for a moment and think, gosh, look at these transfers that are happening, like Florida State picking up Paige Kalkoff. You know, that that's that's a big deal transfer. And then, you know, FIU, FAU, they're picking up people, some international talent as well. Um, you're seeing people from uh, Paraguay to Czech Republic, from Spain. Um, gosh, all these countries they are coming and play D1-2 volleyball, and they're coming in basically representing their countries with that talent. So, you know, I don't even want to get in that game. That's why I put the question to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's so fun. It's fun to continue to see the sport just reach new heights. Yep. All right. So we do know who the coach of the year was. We named that or the ABCA. That's uh, Kristen Moore of GCU. But Blank was also coach of the year worthy. We'll start with you, Alana. Um, this is a very, I don't know how to say this, basic answer, I guess, because of ju it just one little moment clicked for me. Um, Charlie, your head coach, actually, I was watching the Pac-12 North and the, I think it was, I forget who was announcing, but they mentioned that they interviewed them and they said that they were like, you know, well, over quarantine, we kind of reevaluated the way we were coaching and wanted to really adapt to how the girls are playing and not how we want them to play and that type of thing and kind of, you know, evolving how they are going about things and making things not as structured and kind of, you know, adapting their coaching rather than uh, making the players adapt to the coaching. And that's really just, I think, super important and not everyone plays the same. And I, it's great when people realize that. And um, I think it unlocks people's true um, potential and ability. Yep. It's Andrew Fuller doing some great work there. Right, Charlie, you, you're still on the team. So we know you're <laughs> oh, I mean, <laughs> say a lot of great things about my team and then I guess you kind of cued it off I think in addition I mean I've never gotten the chance to fully be coached by him but I think Todd Rogers um I I think he could honestly possibly get that award every single year to be coach of the year he's just a phenomenal every single person from Cal Poly that I've ever spoken to has said so many absolutely wonderful things about Todd um that I think he undeniably like could 
get that award any single year and it would not surprise me it would make me quite happy he's like i've heard incredible things about todd at cal poly yep how about you mads um the cliche answer coach dane blanton at usc i mean his team they were incredible, obviously. Uh, and then Coach Hector at TCU, I think their regular season was pretty phenomenal. So I think he deserves to be mentioned. Yep. I'm going to jump in on this one and say head coach Russell Brock of LSU. And yes, they've won. They've had a winning record. But he finds these athletes who mm -hmm. maybe touched a beach volleyball for a total of six months and come the start of the season. They're these phenomenal players getting the Ws. And they had got an awesome mindset. I, I don't know what he does in his locker room, but they buy in, they play with 110% effort and they use their skills to their best of their ability and they win and they do it. Not, I think we talked about this earlier uh, in one of the episodes with Charlie, but LSU, their ones and twos are kind of new, but they're winning at the three, fours and fives. You know, like, oh, we got this one. He could be up 2-0 on LSU. And the three, four, fives come knock you right out. So um, definitely great team culture, but a lot of it has to do with, uh, with coach Russell Brock. And uh, I know just because of the interview I had with him, you can tell he just has a great culture that the girls have bought into. Hi everyone. This is Madison Fitzpatrick at Florida state and you're listening or watching college volleyball weekly beach edition top 20. Hi, I'm Erica Brock from FAU. Hi, Mackenzie Morris from FAU. And you're listening to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition. We're going to go to our NCAA portion of these PTI questions. I think Charlie kind of answered this one already, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it again. The biggest upset of the NCAA Collegiate Beach Championships was fill in the blank. I'm going to go with Mads on this one. I was going to say what Charlie already said, Georgia State <laughs> knocking out number two TCU out of the tournament. I mean, obviously, TCU is one of our rivals so we were happy to see it but also i'm a huge georgia state fan and they're just grinders like those two twins played such a hard tcu team and they fought the in fought like not against each other but like they battled um as hard as they could and it was so much fun to watch and i think everyone in the entire country was uh, other than tcu fans was rooting for georgia state just to you know make a statement and they really did yep alana uh, personally, I also think Georgia State gets this, but it was against GCU instead of TCU. I know they're twos. It came down to it. Um, and I mean, Allie Hansen and Alana Snavis of GCU, they're just really consistent. They, you know, they got a little bit of everything in their skill sets. And, um, you know, Georgia State, I, I don't follow that much. So to kind of see them, in my opinion, come out of nowhere and do what they did is just, it was great and fun to watch. And then Charlie. Yeah. So I had said the Georgia state upset of TCU. I think Georgia state just takes the cake on upsets. Um, I think, I don't even know if anybody was really expecting Georgia state to be in this tournament, to make it to the NCAA tournament. And they come in as the 10 seed. Nobody's expecting them to perform at all against really, really top tier talent. Like they were in a tough bracket. Grand Canyon had the most phenomenal season they've ever had. TCU had the most phenomenal season they've ever had. And they took both of them out in their path. Like they didn't just win their first game in an upset three, two, that was insane in single elimination round. They then came and won their first round against the number two seed in the entire tournament who had been phenomenal the whole season and just swept their first round. So Georgia state, I mean, like hands down to me just takes the cake on upsets. Like, I don't care which game it was. It was just Georgia state and they did phenomenally. Yep. All right. Here's the uh, next question. Um, what individual or pairs team are we looking at here? It says it's blank had phenomenal performances at Gulf shores. So you want to name an individual or a pairs team. Um, let's start with Elena on this one. Um, going back to it, we mentioned them already. I'm going to go back to the uh, Ferrari twins, you know, just watching them play. You don't think that they're as undersized as they are. They play very big. And then you see them on the net or you see them standing next to someone else and you realize they're five, four, five, five. They just play so big and you can see how intense that they are in the game. And, but their connection is great. And they really, you know, listen to each other, whether they actually are or not, it looks like they are. Um, <laughs> but I think they were really impressive and kind of, you know, really undersized and 
kind of surprising people. So it's fun to watch them. Angel and Bella Ferrari of Georgia State. Gotta love it. Five, four towers. <laughs> Let's go to Charlie. Madison Fitzpatrick and Alina Chacon of Florida State. That's, you guys are <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll jump over to Madison, who was her <laughs> phenomenal performer or performers. Yeah, I, I have a few. Um, Morgan Chacon and Jordan Polo were really fantastic this year, really consistent wins. I think their only losses at national championships uh, was to the Norse Twins. So also the Norse Twins, I think they were undefeated. They had a great tournament. And then also uh, Maddie Anderson and Brooke Bauer had that big win versus UCLA. So I thought they did yeah. well too. I had to drop one in there myself because they did not lose at all at Gulf Shores and they held teams to eight and six without dropping a set. That's uh, Julius Scholes and Delaney Maple. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize they had hammered some teams in the championships or in the national championship matches. So, you know, great performance by both Delaney and Julia. Um, let's see our next question. Oops, I jumped the wrong direction here. Oh no, here we go. The NCAA championships going to 16 teams was fill in the blank. We'll go with Mads. Fun and stressful. <laughs> Alana. Um, great. I loved it. All right. And Charlie. Huge for beach volleyball. Stressful <laughs> for sure in that do or die round of 16, but huge for the sport of beach volleyball. Yep. And then a little intricacy of the tournament itself. A single elimination first round matches were fill in the blank. We'll go Charlie first. I think a couple words come to mind, but like the things that in my head are like right there are gnarly and intense. Um, I think everything was gnarly and intense. The stress was there, but I think it being gnarly and intense are the top two. Yep. Alana. Uh, not being there, I didn't get to experience it firsthand, but it's really fun to watch um, because you know, it's like a do or die situation and everyone gets really into it. And I think it makes it more exciting to watch being on the outside. Yep. And Mads. Uh, ridiculously nerve wracking. We almost lost to Cal Poly to knock us out. I was like, that's, this is my last volleyball game ever. There's no way. I almost started crying, but like just that level of nerve wracking stress. And then UCLA almost got knocked out by Stetson. Like that single elimination round is nerve wracking yeah well i kind of baited you guys into this question because you know, have three different experiences of the gulf shores national championships but in one of my earlier interviews of one of the coaches who shall go unnamed they said why don't they just make it a double elimination tournament so teams can truly enjoy the experience because teams are going to come in their nerves in that first round and you're trying to tell me that if they lose they get to go home after flying across the country you know mm -hmm. and i was like you're right well, why didn't you say something? But I think they're no longer part of the board there. So, but a double elimination tournament would be so exciting. And I think it would open it up to so many more upsets. So just the, my two cents, but I mean, how as an athlete would you be affected if that turned into a second or a, a, um, a double elimination tournament? And we'll start with you, Alana. Um. I think I would love it, but it would also be really hard on my body. I think that would be just a lot of playing and a lot of recovery, but um, I think it would, it would um, prolong the experience. I think it would be great because I always felt bad for the teams who go and then lose and then they're done. So like, they don't really get to get to have the full experience. They don't really get to see what happens and stuff like that. So I think it could be um, good for good for the sport and good for the teams and stuff. Yep. Mads? Yeah, I'm sure Charlie can speak more on this, but I'm sure you just have so much left in your tank. Like I just felt so bad seeing Stetson have to walk away after fighting that hard. Like you really, the experience is so incredible. I just feel like people deserve to be there for longer. Maybe in the future it'll happen. I feel like it definitely should. No, well, I could see it going to a 32 team tournament easily. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <that'd be> awesome. <laughs> Charlie, anything to add? Yeah, being on one of the teams that actually got eliminated first round, um, 
I had definitely, it definitely stung. I think it's also, I mean, looking at the bracket, you can see we lost 3-0 to FAU. So in theory, like it looks like we got swept, but actually four out of our five courts went to three and everything was really, really neck and neck and close. And so that one stung a lot. And to know like season was over after we had fought that hard and fought that hard in all of those matches was really, really tough. And then all of a sudden we were scheduled for a flight the next day. Um, and then it ended up being, like I had mentioned earlier, a 30 hour travel trip home for us because we had a bunch of flight delays. There was a storm in Dallas where our layover was supposed to be, um, which ended up causing us to not really leave the Pensacola airport. Um, and only half of our teams even made it out of that airport that night. Um, so I, I mean, we left Gulf Shores at, I think 11 or 12, um, 11 AM or 12 PM in the, on the Thursday. And we didn't arrive back to Stanford until 3 30 PM the following day. Um, oh my gosh. um, so I think that that one stung even more just because of the fact that we had so much left in us. I mean, we were not ready for our season to end. Um, and it was just, it, it, it was heartbreaking and I, mad props to Florida Atlantic. Like FAU was a phenomenal team and they absolutely did incredible things this entire season. So no, no, nothing harsh to say about them because they're a phenomenal team and they did phenomenal things. But I think that there was definitely gas left in our tank that um, never got to be expended at the end of it. Yeah. Well, want to end the episode because three, all three of you are in different stages of your lives and careers. So I wanted to give you a chance to respond to what's next for all of you for this upcoming year. And we'll start with uh, well, the youngster on the, the screen would be Atlanta. Um, I think what's next, well, what's right now is I'm interning um, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I've never been here before, but um, it's really fun. I'm loving it and working every day. Um, what's next for me, though, is just to, you know, enjoy my senior year. Still unsure about a fifth year yet, um, but we'll see. So I'm just really excited to get back in the sand and see my team again. All right, let's jump over to Charlie. She had a lot of news this year, academically. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so graduated with undergrad and got accepted and started my graduate program at Stanford. So I will be playing one more year, uh, finishing out my fifth year and finishing out my NCAA eligibility, playing for Stanford again. Um, super excited to be back with my team to finish kind of what we started this last year. And uh, yeah, so I'm current, and then I guess currently I'm interning part-time or full-time interning, but fully remotely and playing on the AVP tour. So I'm actually currently getting ready for matches tomorrow at AVP Denver. And Yay. you're playing with? Amy Ozy. She was our, the grad assistant coach of Cal Poly. So she's, I mean, massive shout out to her. She's um, an incredible player, human being, everything. Um, so I'm super excited to be playing with Amy. This and summer. she too is your roommate, I'd imagine, like everyone else. Not my roommate. <laughs> no, not my roommate. Just a phenomenal human who I'm really, really great to be partnered with. And our more senior contributor, Matt Fitzpatrick, what's next in your chapters? Well, I'm done with beach volleyball, like competitively. So very sad about that. It hasn't hit me yet, but now I get to be a fan of the sport and root for Charlie and her AVP and root for Brooke and Elena and like it, I'm just really excited to dive into supporting all the people who have been so amazing throughout my career. Um, so I'm going to keep watching beach volleyball, but I'm applying for a bunch of jobs, um, reporting jobs, broadcasting jobs, on air stuff, um, putting my feelers out there. I've applied for like 30. So we will see what happens. I'm excited for this next step. I'm good to go wherever, move to wherever, do whatever I need to do. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, ladies, I cannot thank you enough for doing our recap episode of College Volleyball Weekly Beach Top 20. That's Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford, Alana Rennie of Arizona, and Matt Fitzpatrick of Florida State. Another year of service for uh, you two ladies and Alana, looking forward. And Charlie, since you're back, but I haven't really formally asked you guys yet. We'll see. I'm back. <laughs> I can tell you for sure. And we'll take Mads back as long as she's able to. How about that? <laughs> no, I'll take it. <laughs> I know that school is the number one thing and your, your playing career. So I know that it's, it's, it's quite the demands now with it growing so quickly. But that's one thing I definitely felt this last year. With the amount of competition across the board in the top 20, you really had to follow all the matches. 
you know, anywhere from 11 on was grinder fest, or actually we'll say eight on was basically up for grabs mm -hmm. this year because they were all jockeying back and forth. I mean, we didn't mention anything about like Long Beach State, South Carolina, um, it's Stetson, you got uh, Florida Gulf Coast. I mean, all these teams, Tampa had some big uh, duels this year. I mean, there are teams out there that are coming to knock the top teams off the top. So, um, but there's a lot to follow. So I know it's quite the commitment, but I appreciate all you guys' time to the podcast and the podcast and just all your input this season. It's been, as always, it's always wonderful working with all of you. And I cannot say thank you enough. Of course. Thank you so much. It's always been an honor talking with you guys about the sport we all love. Uh, it's great. <laughs> Same. Echoing it all. Thank you so much.